Welcome and happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Yes. Right now here in Kentucky, we see lots of flowers, all kinds of flowers, just all scattered out. And so uh, while I was thinking of how much beauty we see in the fresh green coming out, it reminded me of a song in this hymnal, number 22, For the Beauty of the Earth. For the beauty of the earth, for the glory of the skies, for the love which from our birth over and around us lies, Lord of all to Thee we raise, this our grateful song of praise. For the joy of human love, brother, sister, parent, child, friends on earth and friends above, pleasures pure and undefiled. Lord of all, to Thee we raise this our grateful song of praise. For the gift of Thy dear Son, for the hope of heaven at last, for the Spirit's victory won, for the crown when life is past. Lord of all, to Thee we raise songs of gratitude and praise. The song says in verse 2, Pleasure is pure and undefiled. When we have Jesus, when we have His joy and His peace through His Holy Spirit, we have pleasures that are pure and undefiled. We don't need the pleasures of sin. We can live so well without them when we have the true joy giver. All right, we have a lot of dogs that have joined us for our time. They're uh, they love their owners and they want to be with their owners while they're out worshiping in the woods. And so some of them can be loud. And so we're going to pray <laughs> that the Holy Spirit will be present and help them to be calm and quiet during this time. <coughs> yes. When Jesus says to the storm, peace be still, what happens to the storm? It's still. So when he tells the dogs, be calm, be quiet for Bible study, then they're calm and they're quiet. All right. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful that you've given us sunshine today. Thank you, Father, for the beauty in this earth. Even though there's sin and the effects of it, there's still so much beauty here. We ask that you will be with the dogs, that you will help them to be calm and quiet so they will not interrupt. We ask that you would send your Holy Spirit, that our minds could be taught by you. We could apply these lessons in our lives later and even today. And we ask that you would also bind Satan and his evil angels, that you would put a guard of angels around us that Satan couldn't break into so that we could hear you speaking to us. Thank you, Father, for your word. And we ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus, Yeshua. Amen. Amen. So, there's some of us here that have had four days to work on this memory verse. And then there's... Others here who have only had the opportunity to work on it for one day. So, we're going to give you an opportunity to bring out what you have put in to your mind. 
Who's going to go first? <laughs> Caitlin. <laughs> for thou art my rock and my fortress, therefore, for thy name's sake, lead me and guide me. Psalms 31.3. Yes. Oh, it would be easier if I would sing, go through it first and sing it. That would give an advantage. Mm -hmm. Therefore, for thy name's sake, lead me and guide me. Therefore, for thy name's sake, lead me and guide me. Psalm 31, verse 3. Here, brother, you look there and make sure that I don't mess up right there. Okay. For thou art my rock and my fortress. Therefore, for thy name's sake, lead me and guide me. Psalm 31, verse 3. All right. Brayden, are you ready? Mm, yeah. Try it. I don't know. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll help you. Okay. I, you can repeat after me. For thou art my rock and my fortress. For thou art my rock and my fortress. Therefore, for thy name's sake. Therefore, for thy name's sake. Lead me and guide me. Lead me and guide me. And Psalms 31, verse 3. Yes, I didn't have to help you with the reference. That's good. <laughs> this is your memory verse because you are a rock climber. Okay. For thou art my rock. And my fortress. Okay, yeah, now it's on. Yes, yeah. yes, this is, yes, by, by tomorrow you're going to have it memorized. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Anyone else want to, uh, oh, Stephanie. For thou art my rock and my fortress, therefore for thy name's sake lead me and guide me. Psalm 31, verse 3. All right, very good. Anyone else? Okay, what a blessing to learn God's Word together. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Genesis, chapter 24. Genesis chapter 24 and verses 28 through 51. And the damsel ran and told them of her mother's house these things. And Rebekah had a brother, and his name was Laban. And Laban ran out unto the man unto the well. And it came to pass, when he saw the earring and bracelets upon his sister's hands, and when he heard the words of Rebekah his sister, saying, Thus spake the man unto me, that he came unto the man. And behold, he stood by the camels at the well. And he said, Come in, thou blessed of the Lord. Wherefore standest thou without? For I have prepared the house and room for the camels. And the man came into the house, and he ungirded his camels, and gave straw and provender for the camels and water to wash his feet, and the men's feet that were with him. And there was set meat before him to eat. But he said, I will not eat until I have told mine errand. And he said, Speak on. And he said, I am Abraham's servant. The Lord hath blessed my master greatly. And he is become great, and he hath given him flocks and herds and silver and gold and men servants and maid servants and camels and asses. And Sarah, my master's wife, bare a son to my master when she was old. And unto him hath he given all that he hath. And my master made me swear, saying, Thou shalt not take a wife to my son of the daughters of the Canaanites, in whose land I dwell. But thou shalt go unto my father's house, and to my kindred, and take a wife unto my son. 
And I said unto my master, Peradventure the woman will not follow me. And he said unto me, The Lord before whom I walk will send his angel with thee, and prosper thy way. And thou shalt take a wife for thy son of my kindred, and of my father's house. Then shalt thou be clear from this thy oath, when thou comest to my kindred. And if they give not thee one, thou shalt be clear of my oath. And I came this day unto the well, and said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, if now thou do prosper my way, which I go. Behold, I stand by the well of water. It shall come to pass that when the virgin cometh forth to draw water, and I say to her, Give me, I pray thee, a little water of thy pitcher to drink. And she say to me, Both drink thou, and I will draw for thy camels. Let the same be the woman whom the Lord hath appointed out for my master's son. And before I had done speaking in mine heart, behold, Rebekah came forth with her pitcher on her shoulder. And she went down unto the well and drew water. And I said unto her, Let me drink, I pray thee. And she made haste and let down her pitcher from her shoulder and said, Drink, and I will give thy camels drink also. So I drank, and she made the camels drink also. And I asked her, and said, Whose daughter art thou? And she said, The daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, whom Milcah bare unto him. And I put the earring upon her face, and the bracelets upon her hands. And I bowed down my head, and worshipped the Lord, and blessed the Lord God of my master Abraham, which hath led me in the right way to take my master's brother's daughter unto his son. And now, if ye will deal kindly and truly with my master, tell me. And if not, tell me, that I may turn to the right hand or to the left. Then Laban and Bethuel answered and said, The thing proceedeth from the Lord. We cannot speak unto thee bad or good. Behold, Rebekah is before thee. Take her and go, and let her be thy master's son's wife, as the Lord has spoken. We are on page 9. Day 4 of quarter 2 in year 1 of our family Bible lessons. The man had asked for entertainment at her father's house, and in his expression of thanksgiving he had revealed the fact of his connection with Abraham. Returning home, the maiden told what had happened, and Laban, her brother, at once hastened to bring the stranger and his attendants to share their hospitality. Rebekah ran home to tell her family about Abraham's servant. Laban, Rebekah's brother, heard the story, ran to Eliezer with courteousness, invited him home, saying, Come in, thou blessed of the Lord. Wherefore standest thou without? For I have prepared the house and room for the camels. The animals were cared for, and water was given to the men to wash their feet from their dusty travel. Food was prepared for them to eat. But Eliezer could not eat until he had shared why he had come and how God had answered his prayer. Then Laban and Bethuel answered and said, The thing proceedeth from the Lord. We cannot speak unto thee bad or good. Behold, Rebekah is before thee. Take her and go and let her be thy master's son's wife as the Lord has spoken. Eliezer would not partake of food until he had told his errand. 
his prayer at the well with all the circumstances attending it. Then he said, And now, if ye will deal kindly and truly with my master, tell me. And if not, tell me, that I may turn to the right hand or to the left. The answer was, The thing proceedeth from the Lord. We cannot speak unto thee bad or good. Behold, Rebekah is before thee. Take her and go, and let her be thy master's son's wife, as the Lord has spoken. We have a review question. What did Rebecca do after Eliezer told her who he was? To refresh our memory to answer this question, let's go back to Genesis chapter 24. And we're going to read once again verses 28 and 30. And the damsel ran and told them of her mother's house these things. And it came to pass when he saw the earring and bracelet upon his sister's hands. And when he heard the words of Rebekah his sister, saying, Thus spake the man unto me, that he came unto the man. And behold, he stood by the camels at the well. What did Rebekah do after Eliezer told her who he was? She ran home to tell her family about it. Yes, that's right. She ran. All right. There's our second question. Who was Laban? And what family character trait did he have? That was her brother. That's right. Yes, Laban was Rebecca's brother. And what character trait did he have that was running in the family? Courtesy. Courtesy, yes. Hospitality. Yes. That is right. What was the first thing that Eliezer did after the animals and the servants were taken care of and fed? He shared why he had come and how God had answered his prayer. That's right. <laughs> So before he would relax and eat, he wanted to tell them personally. They had heard through Rebecca why he was there, but he wanted Eliezer wanted them to hear it personally, directly from him, why he was there. And how did Rebecca's father, Bethuel, and Rebecca's brother respond to Eliezer's purpose in being there. They said, this is from the Lord and take her as his wife. Wow. Yep, take Rebecca to be your master's son's wife. Wow. He must have made a good impression. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, they... Must have been amazed at how the prayer was answered. Yes. This question has already been asked, but we'll ask it again. What character quality did Abraham, Eliezer, Rebecca, and Laban all have? Courteousness. Yes. Courtesy, hospitality. Yes. So, what are your thoughts on him giving her jewelry and bracelets? So, in that time and place in history, they didn't have cash money like we carry around today. We have money that we, you know, it's just paper. We may have some coins, but we just carry around paper. Um, in that time and that place, they didn't have paper money. So... If you wanted to keep your money safe, you would wear it around your neck 
or you might poke a hole in your ear <laughs> and dangle it from your ear or you might have it carefully concealed in a bag under your clothes uh, and so it was customary at that time to have jewelry and when a woman was married the uh, money was given from her father so that the man that was interested in, in the young woman and wanted to marry her, he would give money to the woman's father. And then the father would in turn give money to his daughter. And then his daughter would have this, this money and it was, it was ju oftentimes jewelry, in the form of jewelry, uh, as something of value. And then if some circumstance happened where her husband died or he decided to divorce her, she would have some money uh, to be provided for. So in that time, in that place, there was a purpose for the jewelry. It wasn't just, oh, you know, look at, look at this. It was customary in that time for women to wear jewelry. Um, but we read in the New Testament, let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 9. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair, or gold, or pearls, or costly array, but that which becometh women professing godliness with good works. So in some King James Version Bibles, they have changed this word from broided to braided. So embroidery is where you, you may have seen like a, a, a picture that was they use embroidery in a cloth to make the picture. Uh, in the sanctuary, they had the veil between the holy place and the most holy place. And in that veil, there was golden threads or wires, and it was embroidered. Angels were embroidered in that, uh, that veil. And so, broided hair, back in the time of the Romans, they would take like, silver or gold wires and braid it into their hair and then it would attract attention it was you know uh, drawing attention and so uh, they Paul was addressing this in his time and he was saying that women don't need this outward show of pearls or gold or jewelry in the ears or they don't need that the beauty that they have is in the heart the Spirit of God in the heart. That beautiful character, that radiant smile, that joy that Jesus gives that comes up from the inside and it flows out. A woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. That's right. Yes. Uh, and you're quoting from the book of Proverbs, chapter 31 and verse 30. It says, Favor is deceitful. And beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Does it really add value to you to poke a hole in your ear and wear an earring in your ear? Does it really add value to yourself to have a pearls dangling around your neck? Does it really add value to your life to poke a hole in around your belly button and put a ring in there? What about poking a hole in your lip and putting a ring there? Or all these things that we do. Uh, let's go to the book of Deuteronomy. What is the fear of the Lord? The question was asked, what is the fear of the Lord? To fear the Lord, it doesn't mean to be so terrified that you are going to run away. The fear of the Lord is to respect Him. It's a healthy kind of fear. So when I'm on the edge of the cliff, I have a healthy kind of fear. I'm going to be careful how I walk 
at this edge of this cliff. That's a healthy kind of fear. So I have respect for the law of gravity because I've fallen before and I don't want to break any more bones. And so the fear of the Lord is this healthy respect where we know that He has laws. We know that He has boundaries and we don't want to disappoint our Maker. That is the fear of the Lord. So we're going to Deuteronomy chapter 15. And verse 12. And if thy brother, an Hebrew or a Hebrew woman, be sold unto thee and serve thee six years, then in the seventh year thou shalt let him go free from thee. And when thou sendest him out free from thee, thou shalt not let him go away empty. Thou shalt furnish him liberally out of thy flock, and out of thy floor, and out of thy winepress. And of that wherewith the Lord hath blessed thee, thou shalt give unto him. And thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in the land of Egypt. And the Lord thy God redeemed thee. Therefore I command thee this thing today. And it shall be if he say unto thee, I will not go away from thee, because he loveth thee and thy house, because he is well with thee. Then thou shalt take it all, and thrust it through his ear unto the door. And he shall be thy servant forever. And also unto thy maidservant thou shalt do likewise. So with God's people, his direction was, if you have someone working for you as a servant or as a slave, they work for you six years. But in the seventh year, you let them go free. But... There were servants who loved their master. They liked working for their master. They were happy there. And so they said, no, I don't want to go free. And so the master would take an awl and poke a hole in the ear. And then that would be a sign that they are a slave for life. They're a servant for life. And so in order for you to know that the ear had been pierced, you would have to put some kind of something in there to keep the hole open. So, slaves would have an earring in one ear. Interesting. But now, a free person who was not a slave uh, would have probably earrings in both ears and, and more jewelry. If you're going to base your life on the Word of God, do you really want to... Like, you, sometimes you see a man just wearing one earring. If you're a man, do you really want to, if you're going to go according to biblical principles, do you want to, like, m use this symbol that you're a slave for life? Probably not. <laughs> you know, you know, no, you know. And, and why is it that in the Christian church that it's acceptable for women to wear jewelry, but it's not really acceptable for a man to have one earring or two earrings? You know, why is that? It never was God's original intention that women wear jewelry, even in Rebecca's time. You know, it wasn't his original intention, but just like it, what God didn't want the Israelites to have a king, they wanted one, and so they had a king. There are certain things that was allowed, but it wasn't within God's ideal will. And so God has given us more instruction now than we had back in the old days, you know. In the Old Covenant, when men prayed, they would cover their heads. Their head would be covered and they you know, be bowing down. But in the New Testament, we are instructed that men should pray with their hands lifted up. You know, so we have more light. We have more blessings. We have more gifts from the Lord now than they did have in the Old Testament. You know, I guess that was a long answer to the question, but we could go and look at some more verses, but uh, hopefully that answers the question. And maybe later we can do a study more specifically to address this kind of question. Okay, any other questions or comments before we move on to our nature study time? I thought it was interesting that Eliezer wasn't just talking to Rebecca's father, but he sat down with the father and the son. 
Yes. And it was like they were deciding together. Mm. I'm glad you mentioned that. So you may be a young man and you may have a sister who wants to get married. If you're a brother, it's your responsibility to protect your sister. And so if you see, if you see your sister going with a man that's not godly, or you see red flags, make sure you communicate prayerfully, carefully, kindly, gently. If you're a, a brother, make sure that you express to your sister your concerns. And then if you're a brother and you're walking with the Lord, you may have a friend who's a brother in Christ to you. And you can help your sister to find someone who's godly. We need to work together and not just make lots of independent decisions. Families that help each other make decisions together, there's so much strength in that rather than just independently making decisions like this. What about women who have no men in their, in their lives? Or in their families? No in brothers? their families? Or... So a question, what about a woman who has no man in their life? You know, like a brother that they can trust mm -hmm. or a father that they can, a godly father that they can trust. The answer to that would be when we read in, it's in Psalms chapter 27. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will raise me up. So there are many women out there who have become Christians and their family doesn't accept them, their family rejects them, their family doesn't support them, and their mother, their father, their brother would be of no help to them in, help, in helping them find someone who's godly. So, yes, Psalms chapter 27, verse 10, When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. For, so, for those women who have no man in their life, like a brother that they trust, or a dad that they can trust, or uh, you'll just have to go to your Heavenly Father and, and be closer to Him and get the direction from Him. But if you can, try to be in a fellowship of believers and then get to know brothers in Christ, get to know them as brothers in Christ, and then tell them what you're going through and ask them to pray for you and help you in the, the process you're going through. Anything else before we move on to the nature, Tom? So sometimes when you're in a relationship with someone and people are expressing red flags, you think, oh, they don't know them like I do, and uh, that's not a big deal. But I would caution you to listen, like truly sit down and listen to what they have to say and like study it for yourself and see if it is true what mm -hmm. they're saying. Mm -hmm. And don't, don't just discard what people are warning you yes so if you're a young person and you're you're you want to get married and a trusted friend or brother in christ or your your biological brother or your parents your father your mother tells you uh hey you know this is a red flag you shouldn't do this uh you still have a decision to make you know and people can be wrong humans can give you wrong counsel so if you want to pursue a relationship with someone and someone tells you, okay, I don't think this is good, you shouldn't do this, make sure that you go and you pray and you say, Father in heaven, would you show me whether this counsel that my family is giving me is true? Don't just base your decision on a brother that says, oh, I have this friend and he's perfect for you, my sister. You know, Take it into consideration what other people are saying, but make sure that also in addition to that, if, if you have lots of friends and your family all telling you we see these red flags, that's going to bear more weight than just one person here, one person there. Also, I want to caution you, do not get physical. Do not get physical because when people are telling you these red flags, you're going to be already bonded to this other person and you may agree with the red flags but it's going to be that much harder to um, identify them or agree with them or say like you're right this is something that i should cut off mm -hmm. because you already are bonded 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, physical, you know, hugging, holding hands, that kind of thing. It, it builds a bond, an emotional bond. And sometimes you get emotionally bonded to someone to the extent that you can't really think objectively about that person. And then that person can take advantage of you because of the bond that's been built. Um, a friend of mine, uh, her dad told her, oh, that guy's bad news. He's a snake in the grass. He, he's a snake. And so she was interested in this young man and wanted to marry him. And then uh, the, the young man that she was interested in marrying said, yeah, God told me that you're the one. And so she accepted that as, uh, oh, okay, yeah, we can get married. God spoke to him, you know, uh, and so, yeah, we can get married. Um, if you're a young woman, don't base this huge decision of marriage where your boyfriend or your fiancé says, the Lord told me you're the one. Don't base it on that. You need to both hear God's voice and have His direction in this. Uh, both of you need to see it clearly. He could honestly say that and believe it and still be deceived. And he could be lying too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, he could be lying just just trying to, you know, if, if, I, if somebody says, oh, God told me, most people are more likely to say, oh, okay, and take it into consideration or believe it. Mm -hmm. Or... He himself could have just been deceived. Like, if sometimes if we want something so much, then we think, "Oh, God is telling me I'm going to have this," and it's our own thought rather than a clear direction from the Lord. Very, very, very important decision to make. Yeah. So. You guys, I'm that person that Titus was talking about. And my dad did say that the person that I married was a snake in the grass, and I didn't listen. So learn from my mistakes. Mm -hmm. my, my sister, Esther, I think she'd be happy for me to share this. Hi, Esther. <laughs> so she had a... Uh, she was engaged in... Uh, she's a young man that... She was, uh, they were going forward to get married, and then there were some really red flags. They didn't end up getting married, and she was really hurt over that. And so then Robbie, that she's married to now, he had heard a little bit about my sister Esther, and he was interested in her. And so then he, he tried to get to know my sister Esther, and she said, no, no I'm not interested. And... She told me, oh, he, he's not physically attractive. He's not, you know, she just wasn't interested. So he was really disappointed. But his brother said, Robbie, don't give up. Don't give up that easily. <laughs> so he kept on uh, praying and kept on hoping and kept on uh, trying to get to know my sister Esther. And so eventually they did get to know each other. And then later, my sister Esther's opinions about Robbie's attractiveness changed. <laughs> so, you know, the Bible says that man looketh on the outward appearance, but God looketh at the heart. So because we are humans, we can look at somebody and think, oh, they're not physically attractive. But when, when we get to know them and God gives us a view of their heart, who they really are, what is in their heart, then we see the beauty that goes deeper than just the skin. If, if we make a decision about marriage just based upon the outward appearance, we make a huge mistake. So if God knows the heart, and we don't, then the very bottom line to all of this is if you're considering marriage, pray that your Heavenly Father will show you the other person's heart. Because you won't be able to see it. You're a human. But our Heavenly Father is the Creator and He knows all things. And He can show you the heart. I also
also wanted to mention that the first person that his sister was interested in um, did end up also being a snake in the grass and so it was a huge blessing that she didn't get with him and didn't marry him because it would have been so much heartache for her mm -hmm. so sometimes when you're going through a breakup or a separation of two people it's very difficult and in the moment you wish you had them back but you know trust God and if he's the one telling you not to be in that relationship obey and he will bless you mm -hmm. yes yes yeah. a dragonfly is an insect it has three parts to its body they have long slender bodies two short antennae two compound eyes six six jointed legs and two pairs of lacy wings. They usually live near ponds. Other family members with lacy wings are the mayfly, damselfly, golden-eyed lacewing, and others. Dragonflies are beautiful insects. They remind me of the beautiful character quality of courteousness. Abraham's family practiced it. Bethuel's family practiced it. Does your family practice it? As you work together as a family, remember the beauty of the dragonfly and the little acts of courtesy that are also beautiful. Say, please, thank you, I am sorry, please forgive me or excuse me at the appropriate times. These are courteous words. We can look for dragonflies. I think this is still a little too early here in Kentucky to look for dragonflies, but when warmer weather comes out, they'll come out. And we could use an insect identification book to learn more about the dragonflies. The principles of heaven are to be brought into the government of the home. Every child is to be taught to be polite, compassionate, loving, pitiful, courteous, tender-hearted. Parents, in the strength, the wisdom that God gives you, you can teach your children to be compassionate, loving, pitiful, courteous, and tender-hearted. Yes. Dragonflies are beautiful insects. They remind me of the beauty of the character quality of courteousness. Have you seen dragonflies and they're almost like a rainbow? And like their colors can kind of change as you look at them from a different light. Abraham's family practiced courteousness. Bethuel's family practiced it. Does your family practice it? Dragonflies are among the largest of insects. Dragonflies have long, thin bodies. They have very large wings. Dragonflies are known for their quick, darting flight. They can change directions very quickly, swooping here, darting over there, and hovering in one spot. Dragonflies were created with a loosely connected head which moves freely, like an owl. <coughs> they have very large eyes. Its movable head and its eyes help the dragonfly to see small insects which they catch and eat in mid-air. Dragonflies have large appetites. Remember the beauty of the dragonfly and the little acts of courtesy that are also beautiful. Some courteous words are, please, thank you, I am sorry, please forgive me, and please excuse me. Anything else before we close? All right. <laughs> Our Father in heaven, we are very thankful that you have said, Ask and ye shall receive, 
And other times when we did not ask for the dogs to be quiet while we we're studying the Bible, they barked and ran off and one of the owners had to go find his dog and bring it back. And Since we asked, you have made the dogs very peaceful and quiet for our Bible study. And so you do answer prayers and we see evidence that you are real. We ask, Father, that you will continue giving us what we need. Give us boldness to ask for the things that we need. Bless us, Father, that we can bless others. We ask for your spirit so that your joy, your peace, would flow through us to others. And we ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus, Yeshua. Amen. Amen. Okay. <laughs> okay, we'll do that. There's a, a sister in Christ here who has a cough. And so we're going to ag agree together in prayer for healing for her cough that her lungs can be full and healthy and free. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that you have sent your Son into the world, Jesus, Yeshua, and he is the healer, and we ask for healing for our sister in Christ here. Thank you, Father. We are asking again in the name of your Son, Yeshua. Amen. Amen. And right now I'm like, he does have the gift of healing. Because I literally felt like, like there was just something stuck in my throat that wouldn't come out and makes me cough. And it's literally cleared up almost as soon as you said something about my cough going away. It went away before you even finished praying. I can't Hallelujah. believe I can't believe it. Look, the whole time it's been there. Wow. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you. What, was, what did your throat feel like? It literally felt like I ate, because you know how sometimes we eat vegetation without cooking it? Mm -hmm. Well, I literally felt like there was vegetation and it wouldn't, I couldn't swallow it. And then I even went and ate some bread because the bread's kind of scratchy to see if that would push down if something was in my throat, like a piece of plant mm -hmm. that I had. And it, before he even finished praying, it was right here. It's not there. Mm -hmm. And I've done several things. To, you saw me drink water. Good deal. That didn't go away. You saw me, I eat bread. I was doing everything to cough it, it and it's gone. Mm -hmm. But it, I mean, I know you can do everything through Christ. The, the prayers of a righteous man have built much. And I've seen on several occasions, I've witnessed Titus pray for somebody or something and, and it work like very quickly really? yeah yeah like one time it was 20 seconds my first time up here um, I was hoping my son would be able to come up and um, Titus prayed on that and Christian texted me within 30 seconds mm -hmm. 20 or 30 seconds it was dad I'm coming it was incredible what? and there was no plan for him to come 